What is good, everybody? Welcome to another Gold Standard Podcast production. I am Rob Stats Carrera here with a very special guest. It is time to dive into the draft. We are less than a month away, and I am very pleased and privileged to be joined by Thor Nystrom, Fantasy Pros Draft Analyst. Thor, thank you so much for a few minutes. Of course, man. Yeah, good to be here. You are, this is your life right now. You just told me before we push record, you are at the dentist's office and the dentist is literally asking you draft questions. <laughs> yeah. He, he asked me if I, are you the JJ McCarthy guy? And I was like, yeah, I, I, I guess I am. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess that's, that's what I've become this spring, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun time of the year. It's uh I was happy that I had time to go into the dentist today uh, to get asked that question. But yeah, it's, you know, it's like, it's always crazy in in March and April because it's like, you know, you you watch these guys, you know, my job, what I do, I, I cover college football in the fall. And then I, in the spring, you go deeper into the guys. So it's like you're watching their film, you're researching their analytical profiles and stuff, and then you're writing them up. And then, you know, it's like in between all that, it's like radio spot, podcast spot, streaming show spot, you know, different stuff like that. And so it's you just try to keep everything together and yeah, it's it's just a wild time of the year for sure. It is a whirlwind, and I'm grateful that you're giving us a few minutes here. Obviously, when it comes to the 49ers, there are me and legions of 49er fans clamoring for them to do something and actually invest significant resources in the offensive line. Right now, the 49ers are at 31. Can they stay at 31 and, in your mind, get a plug-and-play starter on the offensive line? For sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the the good news about where they sit is that, you know, I'm coming to you from Minneapolis. The Vikings are obviously, you know, it's all the quarterback is the talk here. Mm -hmm. But the only two position groups, in my opinion, that are that's better than the quarterback class this year, if I was to like rank each of the position groups qualitatively, the only two ones I put above it, offensive tackle and wide receiver. Right. And so, you know, offense and, and some of those offensive tackles, they're guys that you could project to guard right away as well. So it's not just, you know, whatever. But the, the offensive tackle, in my opinion, you can get plug and play guys to start immediately into Friday night. So it's not just at the end of uh, day one. And for the 49ers, you know, to your question specifically, I think it becomes this becomes the three dimensional chess thing of watching the board as it comes down is is does it become a thing of because of the supply and demand thing are there going to be guys that were projected to go higher where then they start falling down a bit do we strike by trading up to stop someone's fall or is it uh you know th th that there's going to be guys available later because of a sort of a push down where then we can try to trade back a little bit we can project that we're going to be able to get a plug and play guy, you know, early on in the second round, mm -hmm. we can pick up some extra uh, picks and, and then do it that way. But you have a lot of options because of the depth of that specific position group. Is the difference in the guys that maybe would are projected right now to go in the top half of the first round is the difference between them and maybe the guys that are projected to go later so big that it's worth the 49ers trading up? Or do you think it's like the difference between like the fourth best tackle and the eighth best tackle is not that big? Um, qualitatively. Between the fourth and the eighth, it, it would depend on what the cost is. But to me, if you're just talking about guys that can come in and start right away and acquit themselves well in the NFL, the, the fourth guy is going to be able to do that. And the eighth guy is going to be able to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking shades of ceilings, I, I think, at that point. Right. Okay. Like and, and, and the risk profile might be a, a bit elevated on the eighth guy. But both there's more guys in this class that are going to be able to, to jump in immediately and, and start, right? Like, um, but you know, like I mean, going down, you know, for instance, I on in, in my rankings, I'm a guy that thinks that Jordan Morgan potentially could could come in and play right away at tackle. Of course, you he could also, you know, you can project him cleanly to guard as well. But you know, he's a guy that uh two four six six seventh tackle with Guyton, right? So six seventh. The kid from uh, a BYU behind them, Patrick Paul. I, I think Patrick Paul's sort of criminally underrated in a different tackle class. 
he's a guy that might even be getting late first round steam, but just because of the tackle class that he's in, he he's you know sort of an afterthought in potentially later on in, in round two. But I mean, let's just talk about Patrick Paul for a second. The kid's six seven, three thirty-three. 97th percentile athlete that was really uh, like like a, a dominant uh, collegiate pass blocker the last couple of years. And, and this guy in this class is sort of an afterthought in this tackle class, just to speak to how deep it is. Wow. Then you have like the, the balls of clay guys, like the, the kid from Yale is super intriguing. I think uh, Blake Fisher from Notre Dame is super intriguing. Like th th that kid was a ballyhooed recruit coming in. He was sort of overshadowed by Joe Alt. But he's a pretty good uh, recruit, or I, I'm sorry, a, a good athlete in addition to that pedigree as well. Certainly has played for a long time. Um, so you have that as well. Roger Rosengarten. There's just so many different dudes there. So, you know, again, it, it's something where you just sort of monitor the board and they can go, you know, whatever direction they want. If indeed that's the position group that you're going to hone in on early on. It's funny that you mentioned the strength of the class because the other position I thought that the 49ers might go at some point is wide receiver. But now you just told me that there are so many good receivers that maybe if they if they don't go tackle in the first round or offensive line in the first round, is there a position you could see the 49ers going into? Do you like outside of those two ones? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, often so. For me, with the 49ers, the ones that I've been thinking about, it's infrastructure on both sides of the line. And then mm -hmm. the other ones that I've been – because we've done some of these two-round mocks, three-round mocks for fantasy pros. The other ones that I'll, I'll sometimes hit for the 49ers is the the secondary as well, um, you know, depending on the way that the board falls. But that that's how I've been going for them is offensive line, uh, defensive line, edge sometimes, and then the um, the secondary. You know, again, just depending on the way that the value is with them. When it comes to the defensive line, a lot of 49er fans are going to be upset because it feels like they always take a defensive lineman in the first round of the draft. Who are the names that could fall to the 49ers at 31 if they were to go there? Yeah, so the, the two names to monitor, if – and, and there is a shot that they fall. There, I mean, like there every year there's guys that are like, oh, these guys they're gonna go in the top twenty, and then they fall to the end of the first round. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just every guy that we say is gonna go in the top twenty is not gonna go in the top twenty. There's gonna be some that that fall down, and the, the two guys, the interior defensive linemen this year that are you know sort of seen as like you know consensus top twenty or top twenty five, it's Johnny Newton and Byron Murphy. But if one of those two guys fell down to where the 49ers were picking, you, you, you might have to put other, you, you might have to put the offensive tackle plans on hold and, and just pop one of those guys. Cause the, the value would be insane. Those are the only two uh, defensive tackles where I, I think you would have to, to do that with uh, the other guys are day two guys. I think you could, you could defer that or into day three even, but those would be the two guys where uh, you would have to think about it. You know, other guys, you know, again, like you start thinking about it on, on day two, there's intriguing guys. Uh, Braden Fiske is a guy that that greatly intrigues me. I don't know if he would get down to where the uh, 49ers are picking in round two because of how well he tested. He's a 99th percentile athlete at almost 6'4", 295. Uh, not as, as good against the run because he doesn't have as much sand in his pants, but he's extremely active. The, the um, pressure rate numbers and everything like that go in line with that athleticism. Um, so, if, you know, if you're looking for a guy that can get after the quarterback, he certainly profiles to do that. Another guy like that, he's another undersized guy, but uh, another athletic guy that certainly gets after the quarterback, Michael Hall Jr. from Ohio State, another sort of three technique -y guy. Um, and then uh, uh, sort of another guy like this, another athletic freak, uh, Bruce Feldman, uh, freak lister in the past for Michigan, uh, Chris Jenkins. Uh, would be another mm -hmm. guy I'd toss out sort of in that. And then if you want to go the other way with the, the planet size guy, uh, a personal favorite of mine, won the defensive lineman of the year last year in, in uh, college football was Tavondre Sweat from Texas. You know, the 355 pound, you know, world record, just, you know, crushing <laughs> skulls together and then letting linebackers flow behind them. He's, he's that kind of a dude. So th th those are some of the defensive linemen. But for me, the of the interior defensive line class, it's those two guys that need to go in the first round. And then, you know, outside of that, you know, you're, you're probably more looking at the, the top of day two for some of those other names that I tossed off. I should have mentioned this when we were talking offensive line and I didn't uh, apologize. Mims from Georgia. How do you 
evaluate a guy that has eight starts? How do you project that into the NFL? Yeah, well, <laughs> there's there's certain things that I know that that kid can do, and I I try not to get out ahead of my skis on things that we haven't seen. Um, where I mean, just you know, with my job and like uh, in the past where I've made mistakes is like trying to project logical leaps, you know, of like, Oh, you know, um, like that's where I make mistakes or where I think evaluators in general make mistakes. And like the folks that project, I I, I don't want to like be critical, but like projecting Mims to be like, Oh, this guy's going to be a standout starting left tackle in the NFL. I don't, I can't get there. What, what I, where I can get there is this guy's going to be a really good starting right tackle in the NFL because we've already seen some of that stuff on tape and the athletic traits and the, the body type and everything like that. It all fits. Uh, he's a 96 percentile athlete at six, seven, three thirty, And what we've seen on tape in the time that he's been on the field, it all projects to, and what I understand of right tackle play in the NFL, he reminds me a lot of a guy that I watched a ton as a kid growing up in Minnesota, guy named Phil Lodeholt. I, I don't know how uh, Amiri Smith goes to the NFL and he's not, a, you know, analogous to a guy like Phil Lodeholt. Now, where to me, you'd be getting out over your skis is like, oh, yeah, when he goes to the NFL, now he's 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 going to start being a left tackle that, that's really good. That, that for me is where you start you're projecting something that you you haven't seen before and mm -hmm. so that's where you start getting into sort of the logical leap uh territory but i know that uh mims is going to be a hammer in the run game and i know that at least in the passing game the very least you got to run around a cruise ship to get to <laughs> the quarterback i have a couple of sort of big picture draft philosophies and I don't pretend to, to be a scout or anything like that, but this is just how always how I looked at it. You tell me if you think they're crazy. You tell me if you think there's something to them. The first is kind of what you were talking about. Let's assume for the sake of argument that for the most part, these players are going to be who we've seen. For example, if a guy is not the best run defender, assume his run defense is going to be similar to that in the NFL, that it's not really going to improve that much because you sort of have to protect yourself from that. You can't draft a guy and be like, well, we'll just make him way better in this area. Like, no, assume they are going to be who you see in front of you. Does that make sense? It does. It, yes. Um, there is, as you know, in, in football, it's, it's, the, you know, I, I've talked about this with some of my buddies that, that do this for baseball, um, where they like, you know, they rank, um, you know, some of the like baseball prospectus and they do like the top 101, you know, whatever. And and I, I tell them, it's, you know, like I've had conversations like this in the past where I'm like, how do you do your job? Like, that seems like, you know, so hard watching these like, you know, 17 year olds from the yes. Dominican Republic. And how do you do this? And then they're like, no, 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 no. Your job is the hard one. My job's easy because it is a individual one-on-one -on -one sport that is masquerading as a team sport, whereas your sport, it is impossible to unspool the individual from the team, which it that's absolutely true. And so what you're saying is not wrong, but the there you the hard part of it is you have to unspool it from the context of the coaching they got, the scheme they're within, and then the teammates that may be artificially elevating their performance or artificially pulling it down. A, a great example of this, I'll go back to uh, uh, Josh Allen at Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Josh Allen at Wyoming, his, his counting stats were obviously were terrible. And then there was elements of his tape that weren't good. You know, like if, if you put up a, a highlight reel of his worst plays, it was pretty bad. He also had some some really sick throws as well. But in, and I during his process, I went back and forth. It was it was one of the first years that I I did the rankings. But I ended up, and I'm not, I'm definitely not going to do a victory lap on this because I ranked him lower than the NFL did. But I did give him a first round grade. And that year, there was a lot of people in my industry that did not. 
And where I came down on it after like going back and forth on it was the last, it was like the last two, three games of that season for Wyoming um, of the regular season, Josh Allen had gotten hurt. I'm talking about his last season and Wyoming played their backup quarterback in those games. And Wyoming's offense went from something like qualitatively, they were like the 115th best offense in the FBS, which is what people used as an aspersion against Josh Allen during his pre-draft process. But what they failed to, to mention was that in those two games without Josh Allen or three games, whatever it was in November when he wasn't playing, they had the most unwatchable worst <laughs> offense of in the FBS that I have ever seen. And, and the thing that I told people during Josh Allen's draft process was do yourself a favor and just watch either or of those games or watch both. If, if you can, if you can bear it, it was like the, um, you know, like the ring of college football tape. And, and so the whole point being was even if you, if it's hard for you to acknowledge Josh Allen or Josh Allen's uh, Wyoming tape, at least acknowledge that he pulled the boat up and between that and then his physical ability, you had to acknowledge a qualitative weight to that in addition to the positional value of the position he played. So those three things together, can we not maybe say that that is worth a first round pick in the NFL? Um, so, th so that's sort of where I was at with that. You're not like what you're saying in general is, is not wrong, but there's also contextual things in case by case basis where like guys can get dragged down because of their situation and supporting cast and, and scheme. Like I said, and how difficult is it? Like you may like somebody and so is it tempting to be like, well, if you put him in a different scheme with better teammates, he'll be better. When in reality, that might just be your bias as you're trying to sort of unspool all those things you were talking about. It's a thought. Of, it's a thought experiment I do all the time. Right. Um, but it's impossible to know for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, um, you know, I mean, being the JJ McCarthy guy, this is a conversation that occurs quite a bit. Right. Like, because. People like to do the volume thing to J.J. McCarthy without acknowledging that J.J. McCarthy did not play in seven of the 15 fourth quarters that Michigan had last year because Michigan had 11, 21-plus uh, point leads in 15 <laughs> of those games. So uh, J.J. McCarthy, it was like, you know, 70-plus percent of his passing attempts came in the first half last season, you know, wow. something like that. Uh, and, and against the aggregate best strength of schedule of, of, of those top 10 quarterbacks in this class. I, but I digress, but it, you know, when, when you're thinking of him against, you know, like, let's say if he just swap him against Bo Nix, like if, if he was, if JJ McCarthy, instead of playing in a pro style system where he, you know, most of his passing attempts came in, in the first half in high leverage situations, third and long, when the defense knew what was coming against the aggregate 38th ranked uh, defensive strength, which is what Michigan played. Instead of that, he uh, got to play Oregon strength of schedule, which was the 80th average uh, strength of schedule. And he got to play in this Mickey Mouse gimmicky offense that Bo <laughs> Nix did, where it was the fastest release time of any quarterback in this draft class with the second uh, lowest A dot in this class, where it was a, a spread scheme and you got to do all these first down uh, screen passes. And then your uh, uh, perimeter players, they were d breaking all these tackles. And a, a lot of your passing profile was yak yardage that they were accruing for you against these cornerbacks that are going to be accountants in two years. He would have won the Heisman. So, yeah, you do do that. It's, <laughs> it's a contextual thing that bears mentioning. It's not just that position. It's It's an interesting thought experiment to go through with any of these guys. And I think it only improves your process to be able to do that. Um, which of these guys would excel in multiple uh, systems, which guys would, would not. Uh, and, and, and how the, the guys where it's their counting stats were uh, not flattered by the situations they're in. If you put them in other ones, you know, how would that change? I, I think it's a good thought experiment to go through. The other thing I do when I look at players, and this doesn't apply to all positions because some you can't do this, but especially like skill positions, defensive ends, linebackers, I'll just go to YouTube and I'll just look at their highlights. And I look at their highlights and I say, what is the thing about them that is making me notice them? What is it about them that is popping out to me? And on their best plays, 
And when I identify that thing, do I think that they'll be able to carry that over and do that in the NFL? And most of the time, I feel like that is that is at least a little reliable, especially I feel like at quarterbacks. Like if I'm watching a quarterback's best plays and, and most of them are running and especially like just flat out running away from guys, that makes me really scary because that's something that usually doesn't carry over to the NFL. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think highlights are um, they're at least indicative of high level traits or what players are capable of, uh, particularly at at specific positions. Um, I think like um, on offense in particular, like the skill ones, you know, like, because you get, you can get an idea of uh, the athleticism and for instance, like the receivers, the ball skills as well. Um, But the athletic traits, you, you can get a decent idea from the, the highlight package. Um, you know, if you want an idea of like the consistency and then the, the sort of, you know, valleys as well as the peaks and, you know, you have to watch more of the cutups as well, but yeah, like to get an idea of like the ceiling, you know, you could definitely, you know, get an idea of that from, you know, or, or the idea of like what they're capable of from those, those highlights. I agree with that. Okay. Let me ask you about a couple other guys before we go here. Uh, you can't talk about the 49ers draft and not talk about these week. They're called legacy players. That's how everybody refers to them on 49ers Twitter. I'm talking about Luke McCaffrey, Brendan Rice, and Frank Gore Jr. Um, if you had to pick one of those players and put them on the 49ers, which of those three do you think makes the most sense? Um, well, I like McCaffrey the most. So we'll mm-hmm. just we'll who is the last guy you said again one more time? Frank Gore Jr. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My, my answer remains the same. I've been, <laughs> I I've been banging the drum for McCaffrey the whole time. And recently he has begun to rise, which doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I, it was surprising to me that he came into the process with as little discussion as he did. It was, it was an eerie lack, I, it, not even hype because it wasn't even that he, he wasn't discussed as anything. Like when he came into this process, it was um, based on the way that he was ranked and discussed and the lack of discussion. It was, it seemed to be in doubt whether he was even going to get drafted. Right. Like he, he was seen as like a seventh rounder priority uh, UDFA when he came, like, if you looked at the draft boards, uh, I'm talking like when going back to when we were in coming out of the regular season and okay. b- before the senior bowl. Right. Um, so late January, uh, mid January, I should say, but you know, prior to the, the, uh, 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 senior bowl, whatever. And again, the surprising element to me was, I uh, McCaffrey was a guy, you know, he came, when he came out of high school, he was obviously a, a very highly touted recruit, and he had a frustrating beginning to his college career because he tried to play quarterback at a multitude of schools and it didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. And he finally, when he got to Rice, the third one that he had gone to, that's when he was like, all right, let's scrap this. Let's try receiver. And it immediately took. And he was a awesome receiver in Conference USA for two years the only two years that he played, he was one of the best receivers in conference USA. And you saw utility, his ability to win at all three sectors of the field. Um, he's still learning the position. So yes, by definition, there is raw elements to his game. And by definition, he is going to continue improving. I think the impressive part of his film was that there are elements of his receiving game that are natural. Um, for instance, he's got the light hands thing. He holds on to the ball when he is getting blasted. The concentration that that guy has is ridiculous. He leads this class in for anyone that hasn't watched his, his tape, watch his tape. It's really fun. He leads this class in catches secured with his helmet popped off by far. <laughs> In fact, he might have more of those than the rest of the class combined where he gets, he catches the ball, gets blasted, his helmet pops off, and then he holds onto the ball anyway, which the equipment manager there might need to, that might be a thing where they need to to screw the helmets on a little bit tighter, but he had myriad of of those when, when he was at Rice. But the whole thing is, the whole point being, 
the concentration thing, the toughness, and even when the helmet's not popping off, he catches the ball in extremely tight quarters. Like they would, you know, it's not just, you know, uh, like Keon Coleman's a guy that can't separate. So there's always guys around him, but like Rice would force the ball to him, like in, you know, try to fit the ball between two guys. And then you'd see him, you know, the ball would sort of get tucked in there and the concentration level of this guy, you know, tracking that ball in, catching it. And then, you know, the ability to see it through and then know I'm going to get whacked and, and and hold on to the ball anyway, like the body control on him. He obviously has, has good hands. And then you had to extrapolate that he was a good athlete. I mean, hello, who has better <laughs> bloodlines than that guy? And his brother's been one of the best players in the NFL for years and years. He was also coming into college, one of the best dual threat quarterbacks. We had testing data on him. It's like, this, I mean, I know he was in the G5, but like when he came out, he, he signed with the Power Five and as a dual threat quarterback, and then he transferred to another Power Five. Like, I, I was just sort of surprised that he went under the radar. But then, anyway, like, then he goes to the senior ball and he did well. And then it was like a slight bump up, but he didn't get the true bump up until he went out and tested like his brother did. And so now he's like up in the middle rounds, probably where he should have been before. But yeah, to me, he's. Like, I'm going to end up grading him as, like, round three, maybe round four, but, like, somewhere in there. But that that's how I see him. Like, it, it's not a gimmick. You know, like, when we were at the senior ball, I was getting so frustrated because I wanted to interview him and, like, ask him about his game because there's, like, really interesting thing about his film. But then there was just one dope after another lined up to ask him, like, because it was right around the Super Bowl, like, oh, hey, your brother's playing in the Super Bowl. Like, what do, what do you think about that? I was just getting so annoyed. Like, I wanted to save him, you know, like, like yeah. pull him out of the room and ask him real football questions about, like, his game and, like, you know, how he developed himself as a receiver and, like, what was the transition like going from the quarterback to the receiver? And, like, was it tough, like, having to give up the quarterback thing? Like, you know, wh what elements of receiver do you think you need to work on the most? And, you know, like just different stuff like that. But I never got the opportunity because there was one moron after another <laughs> in Mobile that was like, oh, Christian's your brother. You know, like. Right. Um, anyway, uh, enough criticizing my, my brother and in the media. But uh, but anyway, uh, McCaffrey, if I was a 49er fan, I, I McCaffrey would be great. Uh, I, I don't know if, if Christian wants to play with his brother. I assume he does. But for wide receiver depth, if nothing else. And and I believe that Luke is going to develop into a guy that would be, uh, if nothing else, a reliable number two that can also field stretch because he does have that downtown speed. He's not a four, three guy, but he has the wheels to get downtown. And again, the super underrated part of him is that ability to make those plays down the field because of that stupid concentration level down the field in conjunction with those hands. Oh, that's exciting. I think a lot of 49er fans would sign for that if they could get him. Okay, two more questions for you, and then I will let you go. One, a lot of people think that this might be Debo's last year with the 49ers, and the name I keep hearing in this draft that reminds people of Debo Samuel is Malachi Corley. I have no idea. I've never watched a second of Malachi Corley film, but does that, does that comparison hold water with you? I'm so happy you you asked me about Malachi Corley because I just I just did that five minute love letter so now I can go the opposite way and throw oh boy cold water on a guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that that is not a valid uh, comparison. Uh, Malachi Corley is a running back playing wide receiver, and the okay. Debo Samuel uh, comparisons to him are entirely apocryphal. Uh, <laughs> Malachi Corley, Malachi Corley, he played in. And speaking of Mickey Mouse uh, offenses, you know, I mentioned before that uh, uh, Bo Nix had the second lowest uh, A dot in this class. Mm -hmm. the, the the guy with the lowest was the engineer of that Mickey Mouse offense at Western Kentucky, Austin Reed. And and Austin Reed was the guy who the other guy with the lowest. Uh, they were the two guys with the lowest uh, time to release, and then A dot. It was Bo Nix and and and. Uh, 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 Austin Reed were the handshake emoji in, in, in this quarterback <laughs> class. But Malachi Corley was the guy that Austin Reed essentially used as the running back of that system. Mm -hmm. It's just they don't they don't run the ball, but the, the how the function of like how they do that, they get the efficiency element of that offense is they manufacture touches for the slot receiver in that system in this case being Malachi Corley. That is what he did. 
So you shuttle funnel screens to them and different uh, concepts a lot of times before the line of scrimmage in in that case. But yeah, uh, just a couple of notes that I have on on Malachi Corley from my work on only let me pull it up. Uh, running back playing wide receiver, thick build. He is a tank after the catch. That That's the one part that I agree on. Uh, easily led this class with 40 broken tackles in 2022. Um, and he had a bunch last year, but he, he missed a couple games. Tremendous power and balance for a receiver as a runner, far more akin to a running back in open field, as I mentioned. Not a surprise he began his career uh, at Western Kentucky as a running back after initially signing as a cornerback. Tons of production off screens will also give you uh, real utility in the running game. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why they, they do that Debo thing. Uh, Corley ran an extremely part down route tree at WKU. This area of his game needs real work at the next level for him to develop into anything more than a gadget guy. Uh, he doesn't show much nuance or tactical footwork along his route path in the rare instances when he was asked to go downfield. Instead, he just blurs to where he is going and does an in, uh, unconvincing job deking at the top of his stem. Western, ah. Western Kentucky manufactured a metric ton of his touches for him. Over the past two seasons, Corley had 89 catches behind the line of scrimmage. He led the nation in screen yards both seasons. Conversely, he caught just 15 uh, uh, balls 20-plus yards downfield the last two years combined. That's wow. it. Uh, of uh, his billion catches. Uh, uh, let's see. Had a troubling 23.5% contested catch rate last year, despite a 5.5 A dot that ranked number 495 <laughs> in the FBS. Uh, and then my last sentence needs to be drafted by a team that will use him situationally early on. Uh, I and and gadget intensive. So, you know, like if it here's my whole thing with Malachi Corley, and I don't I don't want to, you know, crap on him too much. He's my wide receiver 23. Do I think he deserves to be drafted? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, the the run after the catch ability, uh, maybe the the new return thing yeah. in the NFL. I think he could do that. Right. Like that's that's something you could break the tackles and what have you. And then uh, the offense initially. If, if you have one of those offenses where, um, you know, you you have a role where it was like LaVisca had at Colorado and Rondale had with the old Jeff Brom system at Purdue, you know, where you're going to manufacture touches for the slot and then you occasionally move them into the backfield. Um, and then you use Malachi as a backup initially, just super situationally. And the idea is we're going to manufacture his touches and spoon feed him initially and then maybe use him as a kick returner year one and then we're going to try to then develop the rest of this stuff that would be the the plan for malachi but you would the only way i would do that personally is if you got him at the correct price point the yeah. way some people talk about him i don't think that it's going to be available you know um the guy that i comp him to it was a guy that his entire it reminds me so much of his process too. I argue with people all of his process where um, people were like, with it was the same thing. People were like, oh, this guy, he's a berserker and he breaks tackles and, you know, he's so well built and he's going to catch a metric ton of balls in the NFL. And Thor, you don't know what you're talking about. And my whole thing with people was, show me times where he wins downfield. The, I, it was it was the same thing. This guy is just a running back that they call a receiver. He can't run routes and he can't catch balls with anyone else around him. But you want to say that he's an NFL receiver that you're going to delineate a premium pick to? Good luck with that. This guy's name was Amari Rogers, who went in the third round. And what that was was it, it was an organ, NFL organization took a blowtorch to a third round pick the second that they <laughs> submitted that card. If you take Malachi Corley in the third round, you will be taking out a blowtorch to a third round pick and you'll be lighting it on fire. If if you, you know, if fifth, sixth round, and then you put him on the developmental path that I'm talking about, and then we we see it through like that, maybe you can develop the rest of the route running to the to the point where then down the road we haven't gotten out ahead of our skis to use that term again, where where then we set him up to fail right where we screw up his entire development and now 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 the whole thing's off 
we do the slow development. We only let him do the stuff early on that he can do. Well, then we use the rest of his practice time to develop them. Maybe then down the road, we can get more utility out of him. But one other contextual piece that I would add, I think it's important to note, um, a lot of these analysts that, that give the love letters to Malachi Carley will not bring this up. Uh, Conference USA, unfortunately, it's a very proud conference historically, but the past couple of years, and in particular this year, it objectively devolved into college football's worst conference out of the 10. Now it's it, it'll be nine this coming season, but it is the worst conference of the nine mm-hmm. qualitatively. Uh, Western Kentucky last year, their strength of schedule was an abomination. <laughs> Malachi Corley, yes, he racked up uh, a bunch of broken tackles, and he is good uh, with the ball in his hands. Uh, so, I'm again, I'm not trying to crap on that, but take a look at the cornerbacks that, that he was facing off against. Uh, again, it, it was a lot of manufactured touches that where he didn't have to do a lot of work to get that ball in his hands, and he was he was breaking tackle of, of, of guys that uh. They have no football playing future uh, on <laughs> okay. these, these Louisiana Tech uh, nickel defenders and uh, these these Florida international strong safeties and uh, these are these are guys that will. Um, it's not just that they will not be going to the combine. It is guys that that NFL teams will not even be sending evaluators to their pro day. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but thank you for educating me because that was a name I had heard and now I will not waste my time thinking or hoping for that 49er Uh, fans you want luke mccaffrey you have been misled to believe that malachi (laughs) corley is a better draft prospect than luke mccaffrey but let me if if you only take one thing from this it is you want luke mccaffrey above malachi corley take it from me beautiful okay and last question um do you remember what you thought of brock purdy when he was coming out um, a couple of years ago. And do you, you know, just because of obviously the ridiculous story that has unfolded now with the last pick in the draft and, and what has happened in San Francisco, do you remember your thoughts on Brock Purdy or was it literally like, I didn't even worry about this guy because that's how off the radar he was. I do. And I'm about to undermine everything I've said for the last 40 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, like most of my brethren and like the entire NFL, I, I ranked him too low. And he's one of those, you know, I, I told you, you know, before when I, I was talking about like the things of my process where I've learned from Purdy is one of those examples in my head. Cause you know, I do, you know, like, you know, like I, I do all of this work on 500, 600, 700 guys per process. And, and so I can distinctly, you know, this has been, my uh, last six, seven years. So I can distinctly go back in my memory and remember my process specifically with those guys. And I, I've, I've been very, very right many times. And I've been very, very wrong many times. And Purdy is an example where I was, I was very wrong. And, and I can go through my process and pinpoint where I began to deviate in the wrong direction on him. There was things that I liked about him a lot, especially watching him live Uh, because I watch, nobody watches more college football than me. You know, of course I cover it and then, you know, whatever. uh, And I'm just obsessed with college football in general. So like, you know, watching it live and then I watch the film, you know, in the spring as well. So I, I just end up having a ton of exposure, but like there was a ton of stuff that I liked about him. But once we, I was... I talk myself out of him is basically where, where I'm getting with this. I was higher on him coming into the process. And then the deeper we got in, it was like, you know, all the, you know, the measurables and then the analytical profile, the turnovers that last year, the fact that they went, I'm doing this off memory. So if I get a couple of things wrong, forgive me. But the last year they had the Iowa state team, they come into the, uh, 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 that season, that was the year where they had all the hype, uh, with Matt Campbell, um, where, you know, the, that was like the fruition of everything he'd been building. And I, I'm pretty sure they had come in top 10, you know, preseason. It was like something like that. And they were one of the, the big 12 front runners. They lose in the bowl game and Purdy that year ends up with a 19 to eight, uh, TDI and T rate and watching his film, there was, um, that year, there was too many instances for me of that last year at Iowa State of the being careless with the ball. And so basically by the end, when I got to the ranking, it was like 
there was a lot of things, I, especially earlier in his career, but it was like, man, lacks measurables, uh, turns the ball over too much. This past year, they should have been better. He had all the help in the world, and and he regressed, and you know, at least statistically, and and so anyway, I just ended up talking myself out of it, and um, it's one of those things that you kick yourself about, right? Like, because I knew that kid was super sharp, and I knew that he was accurate, and where it deviated, and I know exactly where it did, where he was turning the ball over, it was like that team, like they had talent, yes, but like there was games where they were outgunned and Purdy was trying to do too much, right? Like he was he was trying to win those games. Like he was trying to be the, the factor that like overcame it, like in Oklahoma or at Texas, like in, in some, some of those different games. And and the play extension on those plays was the the factor that was leading to some of those different turnovers. And uh, I should have in my evaluation, as opposed to being the thing of like, you know what, I'm going to throw the baby out with the bathwater because, you know, the measurables and then that and then the team underachieving. And you know what? Brock Purdy, you're you're going down in my rankings. I I should have been like, no, th this kid's super smart. He's he's super accurate, and he helped to raise Iowa State out of the gutter. And the only reason for for those those turnovers was he was he was trying to elevate you know the the situation you know whatever. Uh, it, it's not uh, indicative of anything else outside of like the one offs in those uh, particular occurrences. So. It's one of those things like, you know, the longer you do this, you make, you know, you step in doo-doo and then you you learn from it. Um, another guy from the same school I, I stepped in doo-doo on and then I, I learned from it like sort of the opposite way was was really high on Hakeem Butler his year. And the hilarious thing is this year there's a guy in this class who it's like looking in the effing mirror. Uh, yeah. It's it's spooky to me how like analytically – and, and and the the um physical profile it's the exact same and Hakeem Butler was one of the very first years that NBC let me do my 500 board mm -hmm. and 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 Hakeem Butler is the biggest mistake I ever made at receiver <laughs> and then this guy comes out and he's staring at me and it's like holy f Hakeem Butler is it's like the ghost of Hakeem Butler Butler pass do you know who I'm talking about in this class no Johnny Wilson okay he is Hakeem Butler reincarnated he is the exact same frame, the exact same testing. He had just about the same yards per route run in college as Hakeem Butler. He had just about the same um, A dot in college as Hakeem Butler uh, at Florida State as Hakeem Butler did at Iowa State. And he had just about, and this is the scary part of the profile that I should have paid more attention to about Hakeem Butler at Iowa State, just about the same drop rate. Johnny Wilson his drop rate uh, over his entire career was like 12.5%, which is big time uh, red flag area when it's over, you know, four years. And that's, you know, what Hakeem Butler's was at Iowa State. But but anyway, whole point being, you learn, you know, as you go, you learn from the successes, you learn from the mistakes, just like real life. So, but yeah, uh, Brock Purdy, um, I, I apologize to you wherever you are. And of course, Brock Purdy found the correct situation which is you know one other thing last thing uh context about this my job you know you you're not doing this for a team you don't have roster holes you don't have a scheme you don't have a coordinator that's saying like hey you know for the three four that we run like i i really it doesn't like i i just need uh uh one of the outside linebackers that crashes downhill don't matter if he's good in coverage like I, I, ju I just need a guy that will get after the quarterback. That's all we need for, for the defense, you know, whatever. Or, uh, Hey man, like just need a, um, I, I need a boundary corner that that's really good in zone. Um, but it, you know, don't matter if he's like for my job, it's like you, you go through all these guys, but then you're ranking. It's a lot of times you're sort of splitting the baby on it because it's, it, you're, you're doing it outside of that context. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you don't know what team they're going to end up going for. And of course, you know, the, the, the perfect fit and, you know, different stuff like that. You, you don't know if they're going to be in that or whatever. So you just have to do it qualitatively outside of that vacuum in advance. And so, you know, there's guys where they find the perfect marriage 
Brock Purdy is an example of this. Certainly not an excuse. I effed up with Brock Purdy. But like there's there's guys like that where they find the perfect spot and they're going to elevate because of that. And then there's guys where they they get drafted into a nightmare situation immediately. It's it's you know both bad coaching, but more specifically, you know, maybe it's a crowded position group in a scheme that is not advantageous whatsoever for their skill set. They're not going to be used. And then they they wither on the vine. And now all of a sudden they're years behind on their development. And by the time they finally hit the open market, the NFL has moved on. Right. And so, you know, that's, that's another factor to consider. Well, you've made me a better, smarter fan. So thank you. I really appreciate all the time you've given us. Uh, fantasypros.com. Go and check it out. It has everything you could possibly want, not only for this draft class, but of course, for all your fantasy sports needs. Thor, thank you so much. I'd love to have you back once the draft is over and we can talk about who actually the 49ers have selected. Love to. Yeah. Done. Done and done. It was awesome, awesome. to talk to you, brother. Follow him on X at ThorKU. Thanks again. Appreciate it, brother.